Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's session, a close look at IANA's intermodal market trends and statistics. I'm Hal Pollard, the Director of Education at IANA. In today's session, we're going to have a look at current economic conditions, including a 2017 review, the latest IANA numbers, an international intermodal perspective, and a domestic intermodal outlook, what to watch for this year, and finish up with questions. Now, let's meet our panel. Really pleased to have sort of a trifecta of stars from TTX company today. Pat Casey, the vice president um, of, of Fleet at TTX, John Woodcock, the director of market development, uh, and Peter Wolf, the director of market development. So we've got a great cast who have a lot of information prepared for us. So I am going to get out of the way and turn it over to my colleague at uh, TTX. Very good. So we'll talk about the economy briefly and the uh, year-end numbers. So uh, in the fourth quarter, uh, GDP growth dropped off a little bit, but two things that really pulled it down were inventories and net exports. And a lot of that had to do with the very strong sales in the fourth quarter that reduced inventory, it boosted imports, and that uh, did pull down GDP, but it was very good for freight markets. And we think in the, in the first quarter, we're seeing an inventory rebuild and that, too, is uh, part of what we think is part of the strength right now. One of the things to keep in mind with the tax reform is that the housing market may be affected significantly by that uh, because of the tax credit impact. And prices may fall. And we bring this up because the housing market is a very important part of the freight industry um, for many different things, but uh, particularly for intermodal, many imported products. Uh, many domestic products are related to housing starts. So that's a key issue to keep an eye on. Fuel prices have been higher than expected for the last two quarters. And uh, that, we think, is part of what the growth is uh, recently. The other things that are, are driving that, we talked about inventory rebuilds. Uh, that's probably part of the recent strength. Uh, and also the ELDs, and, and we'll talk more about that down the road. We had 5.8% growth in January for North American intermodal, even though uh, retail sales and industrial production fell in January. So that points to what these other factors are. One other thing to keep an eye on is the value of the dollar. Um, and we'll talk in more detail about the impact of that on uh, imports uh, farther down in the presentation. Uh, but the dollar has fallen. It's expected to continue to fall, and that raises the price of imports and will reduce the volume of imports. It uh, doesn't mean that it would be negative, but it could slow the rate of growth a little bit on that. And with the tax reform, we have seen an increase, uh, in the short term at least, in GDP, consumer spending, retail sales, uh, investment, all affected by that consensus. Uh, in the uh, economics is that uh, it will impact that positively, at least in the short term. Longer term, it could have uh, a different impact, particularly if it drives interest rates up as, uh, as federal deficit increases. So we'll see where that goes. But for 2018, uh, we do expect that to, to go higher. And it could have an effect on the Mexican and Canadian GDP, uh, which we list at the bottom, uh, but we haven't estimated that quite yet. Uh, but that will come up. So now we're going to look at uh, the latest IANA numbers, look at what happened in 2017. Uh, the growth was led by uh, International, which is the biggest share of the market. Domestic containers were relatively slow, and trailers bounce up and down all the time, but had a very strong year in uh, 2017, so total of just under 5%. Um, and then you see that double-digit growth in Canada, and we'll talk some more about that. So Canada accounted for nearly 40% of intermodal growth in 2017, uh, while Canada was just 16% of the total North American intermodal market. So a really big chunk of that was the strength in Canada as uh, their economy improved in 2017. And then if you look at the breakout, again, by equipment type, you know, trailers were stronger than domestic containers. And again, we'll talk more about that. That might have been a tightness of domestic container supply uh, that resulted in additional trailer volume because there just weren't enough containers available. 
and in 2017, we had a reconnect between ISO containers and uh, imports, uh, which we'll talk about in more detail, where in 2016, there was a complete disconnection of those two. If you look at regional loadings, you see that there were three double-digit regions, uh, two of them eastern and western Canada, no surprise there. Uh, the Mountain Central was also double-digit, but that's a pretty small share of the total, just 1%. And, and then uh, most of the other U.S. regions were somewhere between 3 and 5% in their growth. One negative one in the Northwest, uh, which mainly resulted from a change in share of imports uh, to different regions from there. And then the top growth the lanes, you see that out of the six there, five of them involve Canada in some way. So again, that was the main driver of 2017 growth was uh, the Canadian lanes. And then the largest declines, you see the Northwest was a big part of that. Mexico was a little weak as well for some of the cross-border business. And then uh, the Midwest and, and the Southeast as well. So uh, several different areas that, uh, that declined in 2017. We'll move on to the international intermodal and Peter will take that on. Thanks, Pat. And good afternoon, everyone. So just a, a quick definition. So international intermodal, most of the marine containers, which are the 20, the 40, and the 45-foot containers owned by the ocean carriers, uh, if they route inland by rail, that's what's considered international intermodal. Sometimes it's also referred to as IPI, or inland port intermodal, or sometimes it's also known as intact shipments. So lots of names, but they all mean uh, pretty much the, the same thing. And so to understand international intermodal, it really starts with trying to understand the, the import forecast. And for 2017, it was a really good year for imports, growing at 5.9%. And as Pat talked about a few moments ago, for all the, the microeconomic reasons, strong retail sales growth, good consumer spending, that was all driving uh, import demand for last year. 2018. I think we see similar growth, maybe not quite as high, but we're still trying to understand the impact of the tax law changes. So we expect import volume in 18 to be pretty good. And then as you can see on the chart that in 2019, 2020, uh, things fall off a bit. And that we think is due to the value of the US dollar increasing, which essentially acts as a price increase. And I think the next slide helps explain that a bit. So as the dollar falls, that acts as a price increase on imports, and the higher the price, uh, the less demand. TTX has done some modeling on the price elasticity of the imports, and just refresh everybody's memory, you know, the, the price elasticity is simply the change in the quantity demanded as the price changes. And in the case of imports, as the price increases 1%, the quantity demanded falls 0.8%, at least that's what our modeling has found. And that's what the orange uh, bar means in the middle of, of the chart. So you can see it almost dips down to negative one. Uh, so just to put, not to put too fine a point on it, but the elasticity price coefficient is negative 0.8, which means a 1% increase in price results in a 0.8% decrease in quantity demand. And the last point I want to make on this slide is that if you look to the commodities to the left of the orange bar and compare them to the quantities to the right of the orange bar, the quantities on the left are more of the retail goods, the goods purchased directly by consumers. And those are the ones that not surprisingly are more price sensitive. And the ones on the right tend to be industrial goods, a little bit less price sensitive. And certainly you can see food products on the right with the smallest price coefficient. And that doesn't come as any surprise, right? People need to eat. So you're gonna buy food even if the price goes up or down a bit. So that's what I wanted to mention on, on this slide. Again, just, you know, we're not entirely certain, you know, it's hard to predict exactly if the dollar is gonna fall, we think it does. But I think we have a fair level of confidence that as the dollar falls and price of imports increase, we would see a diminishment in import volume. And so on the, the next slide, I'd like to look backwards, not just at 2017, but to go all the way back to 2007 to 2016 and take a look at what's been happening in the intermodal world for a bit. But before I do that, I'd just like to point out a few definitions. So if you look at the blue-gray box 
on the lower right, imports. That's what we're all talking about, right? Containerized imports. AWS, that stands for all water share, and that refers to imported volume that originates in Northern Asia or Eastern Asia, say China, Japan, Korea, Vietnam. So it's containers that originate there and then discharge on the East Coast rather than on the West Coast. And then IPI, that's what we've been talking about again, international intermodal. And then transloads, if you've been on the call before, I think you've heard us talk about transloading. And that's simply when an import container arrives at a port, usually a West Coast port, the contents are switched over into a domestic 53 foot container. And by transloading, we're referring to that uh, when it routes inland by rail. And so why do we have these four items on this chart? It's because they all in one way or another impact uh, IPI, right? So imports, Clearly, if imports grow, we would expect IPI to grow. All things being equal, if imports were to grow 5%, we tend to expect IPI to grow at 5% as well. All water share and transloading tend to draw away from IPI. Uh, as an example, we think roughly 70% of all containers that land on the West Coast route inland by rail in one form or another. But if a container lands on the East Coast, uh, there's only a 20% chance that are out inland by rail. So the more all water there is, the less IPI there is. And transloading also detracts from IPI, but it's also intermodal as well. It's just whether it moves in a 53-foot container versus a 40-foot container. So now looking at the, the chart, what does the chart mean? It's We set it up as an index with 2007 as the base year. So between 2007 and 2016, imports grew at roughly 1.9% on a compounded annual basis. And as I mentioned a moment ago, you'd expect everything to grow at about the same rate, all things being equal. But between 2007 and 2016, that hasn't been the case. All water share and transloading have grown at twice the rate of imports, and IPI actually declined to two tenths of a percent. But in 2017, all these trends reversed and that imports, all water share, IPI, and transloading all grew at about the same pace, uh, much different than what the trend had been over the prior 10 years. So I think the, the million dollar question or the $64 question, maybe with inflation now it's a million dollars, is what is 2018 gonna look like? Is 2018 IPI growth gonna look like the past 10 years where uh, it's been relatively modest, especially compared to import volume growth? Or will IPI be more like 2017 volume where IPI growth has matched uh, a strong import pace? So you're gonna to have to wait to the end of the presentation for that answer. <laughs> and so uh, this is just another way of, of saying that looking at the 2017 data and seeing that 2017 was a little bit different and that IPI, all water share, transloading, imports, all grew at about the same pace and it's divided out by port region. Uh, one note for Western Canada is the final 2017 data is not available uh, for Western Canada. We have about 10 or 11 months worth of data. So the numbers that you're seeing, the growth rate is an extrapolation of where we think the 2017 will, will be. So if you ever see the slide again, produced by us, it may be a little bit different number when we have the final 2017 data available. And again, how to read the slide, if you just look at the, the bottom line where it says total, we have Imports growing about 5.9%, IPI at 6.2, transloaded 5.9, total rail 5.8. And again, all water share was about uh, 5.8 as well. So everything grew at about uh, the same pace. So let's talk about all water share followed by uh, transloading and then we're just about done with the uh, international intermodal section. So uh, slide 24, shows all water share for 2017 and, and 2016 as well. In 2017, all water share gained 1.5 share points with most of the share gain in Houston and in the Southeast ports, uh, Savannah and Charleston. So the red line on the bottom, you can see we have this broken out by four port regions as well as uh, total on top. Uh, the Northeast, that's pretty much Port of New York, New Jersey, uh, Mid-Atlantic is really a uh, port of Norfolk. 
southeast is Savannah and Charleston are the main intermodal ports. And in the Gulf, you have Houston, New Orleans, Mobile, but Houston is probably the largest of all the intermodal ports. So last year, Houston and Savannah and Charleston gained share. Uh, Northeast and Mid-Atlantic was pretty flat. Um, the data does not include information on Western Canada because there's no publicly available information uh, that shows where imports, if they discharge in Western Canada, what their origin is. But we've tried to uh, make some educated guesses along those lines. And if you included the Western Canadian data in with this chart, it would show that overall all water share was was pretty flat. And then uh, the next on transload, and again, all water transload, these are things that detract from IPI volume. There are two charts here. On the left shows transloading by share, by port region, and the right shows transloading volume. And there are two vertical axes on the chart on the right. The vertical axis on the left refers to the Pacific Southwest, and that's in millions of TEUs. The axis on the right is for Western Canada and PNW, and that's in thousands of TEUs. So let's just go back and look at the chart on the left for a second. That's transload share. So it's how much, it's what share of imports uh, come into a port region and then route inland by rail in a 53 foot container as opposed to moving IPI. Um, and TTX estimates this two ways. When we look backwards, say it's a 2017 data, we'll take, we'll use the IANA data along with peers data and essentially take a ratio of the 53 foot volume from the IANA data, uh, that's the numerator and the denominator are imports, and get a, a ratio that shows about 35% of what is imported in the Pacific Southwest will transload into a 53 foot container and then route rail inland. Going forward, we make a projection using uh, inventory sales ratios, a ratio of truck price to intermodal price, and a forecast of various types of commodities that are going to be imported, some transloaded at greater rates than others, to give us a projection of where we think transload share will go. And you can see that starting in 2019, it starts to come down just a little bit in the PSW and in the PNW, not by much, just a tad. But if we flip over now to the chart on the right, even though the share might be falling a bit, because import volume is rising overall, transload volume, we think, will continue to increase. And again, with the two different axes, just note that the transload volume in the Pacific Southwest is about an order of magnitude bigger than the transload volume in either the PNW or in Western Canada. The last slide, and so now I'm trying to trying to answer that $64,000 question, what's gonna happen with uh, IPI in 2018. 2017 was a very good year by all measures. 6.2% was the best IPI volume growth in, in quite some time. Uh, certainly it was much better than 2016's where even though imports grew, IPI declined. For this year, uh, we think IPI will grow in the three to 5% range. Again, we're trying to get a better understanding of what we think that the tax bill might have on import volumes and consumer spending. But in the 3 to 5% range is where we think uh, IPI will go on import volume growing of about 4.4%. So the IPI will grow at about the same rate as import. That's our forecast, at least for now. And now I'd like to turn it over to John, and he'll talk about the domestic intermodal for the next few minutes. Great. Thank you, Peter. Good afternoon, everyone. So I just want to take a minute and take a backward look before we talk about current conditions. The domestic market started fairly anemically in the first half of 2017, with domestic containers growing at about just a 2% rate in the first half of the year. The two bright spots, as you can see on this slide, were Canada due to their their growing econo improved economic health and growing economic activity, as well as what Peter was just referring to, which was U.S. transload on the Western gateways into the U.S. with uh, import activity. They maintained their strength throughout the year, both Canada and, and the U.S. transloading. And in addition, the strict U.S. domestic freight did start picking up a bit to about a 3%, actually just over a 3% gain in the second half. We finished overall at about 2.7% as, as Pat mentioned earlier. 
while I don't have it on this slide, trailer traffic started similarly to containers with about a 2.1% growth rate for the first half. And it accelerated smartly over 11% in the second half of the, of the year, finishing with a gain of about 6.4% overall. And we'll talk about trailers at the end of my presentation. So going into current conditions. So this is an illustration from CAS Information Systems. It's their monthly CAS freight index. And this is a illustration of uh, domestic shipment demand. And you can see that building in the latter, uh, latter half, and particularly the, the latter quarter of 2017, the freight demand through shipments strengthened significantly in, in 2017. And as you can see in the January datum that we have here, it remains very strong, 12.5% year-over-year gain for, the, for January. We're expecting this to tick down a little bit in February due to uh, year-over-year comps, but all the intentions are that we'll see it tick back up with the beginning of the produce season in March and remain strong through the remainder of the year. This is, of course, driven by what Peter and Pat were re referring to earlier, which is increased industrial activity, inventory building, and it's in part been stimulated, we believe, by upstream oil and gas field activity. A lot of development in the oil and gas field that stimulates trucking. One thing that CAS has noted in their remarks is also that millennials are starting to form households and that's leading to great, greater consumer product demand. This is another look um, on the supply side of trucking. And you can see that we're well above average on the U.S. trucking capacity, which is, is about 93% on average is the utilization rate in the trucking industry. And we're bumping up right at 100% utilization. And this is, of course, what most people are aware of is the ELD effect, which is the electronic logging devices that uh, truckers were mandated to use by the federal government beginning in December of last year. And this is certainly having an effect, and we, we believe that it's going to have a, a continuing effect throughout the remainder of the year. Uh, we, we are running at about 100% and should see that until things start to soften a little bit in 2019. The electronic logging devices mandate have a few effects I just wanted to talk about. One was with the number of truckers that are in the industry. Not sure if this is exactly correlated, but Avondale Partners uh, tracks trucking bankruptcies from quarter to quarter. And the trucking bankruptcies that occurred in the fourth quarter of 2017 were nearly four times the bankruptcies that we saw in 2016. And we think that there may be a correlation between truckers that are just quitting the industry because they're trying to get out in advance of the ELD or anticipation of the ELD effect. But it's quite curious and we're investigating that further. Another impact of the, of the ELD effect is, is productivity. Zip Logistics has recently published a report where they're looking at productivity losses and transit time gains on different line segments. And they found that in the mid-distance lanes between 450 and 550 miles, they were seeing increases in transit time of about 16.2%, which is a significant impact on productivity. It's less so on longer lanes, which were they included as 750 to 1,000 miles, but the impact in, in those lanes was at about a 10% productivity hit. So that's obviously uh, by hitting the productivity, it's taking capacity out of the market. So in addition to that, we're, we're looking at the longer term impact and uh, a survey that was just issued by Internet Truck Stop reports that about 20% of drive-in drivers have yet to adopt ELD. So it's a question as to when the ELD enforcement gets more rigid beginning in April 1st, uh, when there's an out-of-service order uh, in reaction to a violation, how many of these truckers will be actually flush out of the active network? So that's going to be watched closely, and we do believe that the uh, trucking capacity will remain tight throughout the year, in large part due to the ELD effect on drivers. One other thing that we're looking at and we continue to look at is that the, uh, the surge in demand has, has caused the trucking industry to pick up the pace on class eight truck ordering. So they're actually trying to bring more capacity into the network with regard to their tractors. From all reports, we see about 30,000 trucks a month ordering would be a, a normal replacement rate. We have not seen that for years. And uh, in fact, in the first three quarters 
of 2017, there were about 18 to 19,000 truck uh, class eight trucks ordered per month. However, in the fourth quarter, that total went over 32,000 per month. So the truckers are trying to play catch up and trying to catch up to the uh, demand that is out in the market. The lead time, however, is about five to six months right now for, for a truck delivery. So again, this is another indicator that the market is gonna remain tight on capacity for at least the first three quarters of this year. This is just a, really a, a, a combination of supply and demand. This is Morgan Stanley's uh, truckload freight index, and it's a, a graphic um, showing what the incremental demand is versus incremental supply. And the higher up you go on the axis, the greater the, uh, the tightness of capacity in the market. And as you can see that we, we started off very strong for the year, uh, which is the, the red line, and well above what the, the prior 10 years average would be. Extrapolated over the rest of the year, you can see that um, that the market will uh, remain constrained for the uh, for the balance of the year. So we've we've actually bumped up our forecast a little bit from what we were uh, what we were considering in the fourth quarter. We're anticipating that the domestic container market will grow about 3.5 percent this year, a little over what our initial anticipation was, and that's in large part due to the uh, economic effects of the of tax reform. And coupled to that, we expect that the domestic container fleet will grow about four to five percent this year. Uh, but from the end of 2017, we estimate that about 296,000 domestic containers were in the North American fleet, and we'll end this year at about 309,000. Here's a, a slide that shows uh, what happened with trailers in 2017. One thing that we suspect is that. There, there was a large bump in 53-foot trailer growth in the second half of this year, as you can see on the on the graph, uh, jumped 13.4% in the second half. We believe that was uh, in part to tight container, tight domestic container supply. Our original forecast for domestic container growth in uh, 2017 was four, I believe it was 4.7% and the actual con domestic container fleet grew at about 2.7%. So it grew a lot it, it grew a lot slower than we originally anticipated. We believe some of the stakeholders in the domestic container market may have put off purchases due to the the lagging demand in the first half of the year and was was caught with short supply in the second half of the year as as demand grew. All right, so what to watch for, Larry? Um, so as, as various leading economic indicators move about, how might that affect transportation and what to watch for? And, and so one of the things we like to look at is the inventory sales ratio, whether it's retail or wholesale, um, and get a sense of, it, it's not necessarily the best measure for looking at the long-term trend, because uh, if you use this the long-term, you'd never say transportation is going to grow. Um, but it's really, it's in the short term. So if inventory, the ratios go up, uh, then you might think that transportation is going to slow because there's enough inventory in stock. And as inventories fall, then you might expect transportation to increase a bit as restocking occurs. Um, it's just as simple as, as that. So the way to read this, or at least the way I read it, is a ratio of about 1.45 means how many months it takes before inventory is being sold. So inventory is on hand 1.4 months, 1.5 months on a retail level uh, before it is, is actually uh, sold off. And it seems to be somewhere in the middle of where it's been in its long-term trend. It hit a, a low of about 1.30 in 2011, and since then it's been slowly climbing. Uh, but back in uh, 2000, it was about 1.6. So in some ways, it's hard to know where the, the inventory levels will wind up in the long term. But in the short term, as they move up and down, you can expect transportation to move in the opposite direction. And that trend since the recession, we've done some analysis on that uh, to see that uh, the growth of e-commerce has uh, helped push up the inventory to sales ratio that had trended down over a very long term before that. And so with, with the next slide, as we talk about the inventory sales ratio, well, how's that going to move? Well, it's interesting that even though January was a very strong month for intermodal and transportation, both retail sales 
and industrial production decline in the month, and that might suggest that there'll be less restocking in the months ahead that would lead to less transportation. Certainly one month doesn't make a trend by any means, but again, what to watch for is to keep an eye on these leading economic indicators, and that will give a sense of where transportation might go in the next six to eight months. So international trade is a very important part of the intermodal. More than half of it is, is either an IPI, a transload, or a cross-border uh, domestic container movement. So um, we'll see where uh, trade policy goes. That has been uh, discussed quite a bit, but no specific changes have been made yet, uh, with the exception of a little bit in the metals industry. Um, but uh, it could have a significant impact on the intermodal business if, for example, there were large tariffs applied to uh, Chinese-produced imports, for example. Um, that could drive down that international and transload volume quite a bit. Or if NAFTA were affected, not as big a share of this, but uh, that too could drive down what's moving across border uh, domestic containers. And it's also interesting that uh, you know, in the intermodal industry, uh, uh, we talk about things moving within North America as, quote, domestic, uh, even though it is moving uh, transborder. And it's, you know, that's consistent with uh, where we are today, the Intermodal Association of North America. Well said, Pat. Um, well, that was that was fascinating and clearly engaged a lot of the attendees because we've got a load of questions for you guys as well. The first one is a question about transloading. Uh, they're, they're curious, why do you see transloading share dropping? A number of folks like Amazon seem to be using transloading. That's a great question, and it could well be that with Amazon in the market and as large as they are, they're the a type of firm that can do transloading. Large firms can do that. And as more and more uh, retailing occurs online, that may push it more to large vendors as opposed to smaller retail shops, individual mom and pop stores that don't do transloading. So it could lead to a, a greater share of, of transloading. So it's a, by that question, it could be that our, our forecast is uh, uh, a bit wrong and there's more of an upside to transloading than, than a downside. What might be holding it back a bit is conversations with transloaders in the past. Is they thought that transloading as a share of imports could reach about 40% of total imports. And you can see on the slide, it was about 35%. But they thought that was sort of the theoretical limit, and they thought the practical limit was about 35%. And so we're sort of butting up to that. And that may be a, 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 one of the ways that it's, it's limiting transloading. We're not sure that's going to happen. Certainly, capacity could be expanded. But for now, capacity, we think, is fairly tight in Southern California. But again, it can always be added in, in relatively uh, a short amount of time. So, uh, But there's not a whole lot of variance to, the, to that forecast. If you look at the long-term trends of transloading, it has grown around 4%, and certainly it has grown faster than import volume. Uh, this past year, it grew at 6%, pretty much as the import volume. So we think transloading will continue to grow at a pretty good pace, 4%. Whether that gain share keeps its share or loses a little share, it kind of bounces around a little bit. But we think the outlook for transloading is, is pretty strong. Do you want to make a comment or comments on East Coast transloading? Uh, sure. So we have difficulty seeing the data. It, it's masked by a number of things, but we suspect that uh, maybe 10% of what imports into the East Coast uh, will move out of the ISO container into a 53-foot container and then route by rail inland. Uh, but that's pretty much a guess as opposed to having some really good solid data. We talk to transloaders, we talk to the BCOs, we talk to the steamship lines, and they've said, suggested that that number makes sense and nobody's really laughed it out of the room, but it's really hard to get to the data. Yeah, and a much higher volume of the import material that's moved out of a 40-foot box into a, a domestic piece of equipment is actually a truck trailer that gets trucked beyond as opposed right. to rail beyond. Right. When we say transload, we're talking yeah. about rail yeah. into a, a rail container, yeah. not, mm -hmm. not a highway truck. Right, yeah. and, and, and part of that is simply with the, in LA Long Beach, we can make a, a pretty safe assumption that not a whole lot origin or is manufactured in Southern California. 
we can't say that in places in the East Coast. We, we know that uh, Harrisburg is a big warehousing center. Atlanta is, is, has been a distribution center for a really long time. We think international freight gets mixed with domestic freight at these locations and routes inland. But we can't say there is no domestic freight being produced at these regions, so we can't make an assumption saying that this container is 100% imported freight routing by rail to an inland destination. That's the, the, the problem with, with that data. So here's a number of questions sort of around the, the flip side of that. What do you think the main driver uh, that caused IPI to grow at the same rate as imports in, in 2017 was? I think part of that was dem demand in Canada was really strong. The, the Canada's 2016 economy was really weak. The Alberta economy is pretty much a, a, an oil-driven economy, and as the price of oil fell, production of oil declined. Uh, and I think the GDP of Alberta declined some astronomical amount, 8%, 9%. I mean, just a horrific year in Alberta. And then in 2017, I won't say it all came back, but it had a pretty good comp. So coming back off of a bad year, uh, the Ontario economy was doing very well. A lot of uh, housing production going on, and that was drawing in a lot of imported cargo going into the new construction. So that helped quite a bit. Um, there also might have been uh, container supply might have been a little bit tight in the fourth quarter, and that might have pushed a little bit more domestic IPI. Containers. Domestic container. Mm -hmm. uh, so that might have pushed a little bit more uh, IPI. Looking at all water share and trucking and the potential relationship between the two, the question is, is there a relationship between tight truck capacity and the all water share? In other words, can trucking capacity push the all water share down, meaning more loads on rail? I think when we look at, at CTX's models of either international or modal or domestic 53s, as the price of trucking increases, that tends to push uh, more volume to rail. And international is just as sensitive to changes in trucking price as a domestic container. And that works in both directions. So the way I'd like to answer that question is if tight trucking capacity perhaps leads to increases in truck prices, that might push more domestic and international intermodal. Whether tight trucking capacity in and of itself, I can't really answer that, but I think tight truck capacity generally leads to increased truck prices, so you can draw your own conclusions. Here's another one related to, to tight capacity. Did you guys see more... Uh, repositioning moves of ISO containers domestically in 2017 because of capacity? There may have been a few more. I don't know if it was tight truck capacity. I, we did see a bit of a shift where there was more uh, westbound flow of ISO containers this year from the Midwest right. back to the, the West Coast. Why that occurred, I'm not sure I, I can answer that with a real solid Is reason. How much of an influence is grain, the grain exports? I'm not sure. So certainly could, could be that, right? Um, you know, we saw more, but as to the why, it, it's hard to say. Here's a, a question around flat car fleet. Is there sufficient flat car fleet to pick up the increased uh, trailer growth? Well, by far, yes. We, we've had a significant surplus in that for many years as things have shifted from trailers to containers. And uh, so plenty of room for additional growth in the trailer market. Here's a good one. How does TTX estimate the North American 53-foot container fleet size? We actually do surveys uh, uh, directly with the owners. So we've spent a lot of time researching the market to understand who the owners of the, the domestic container fleet are. And we reach out to them directly, uh, usually about twice a year. Uh, first in the, really in the second quarter of the year to get an idea of, of how they're progressing, progressing with their purchases and retirements, et cetera. And then we reach out to them again uh, in the latter part of the third quarter to understand it, you know, where, they're, where they're standing for the, for the end of the year. And so it's usually a t twice a year. Sometimes we see in, in trade journals and such or, or talk, by talking to them directly, new purchases that are unexpected and we bake that into the plan. Um, our domestic container fleet, it includes the dry boxes as well as reefers, and there's a small number of flat racks 
in the market. Uh, so we try to incorporate all of the different uh, container types that are have a 53 foot footprint. Here's one that, that's uh, related to that around availability. And you guys had mentioned that the, the pressure on 53 foot availability of 53 foot containers in 2017. Do you see a continued pressure on container availability in 2018? I guess I would say it, it depends right now on the stakeholders. About two thirds of the boxes are owned by private fleets. And so it's going to be depending on their appetite to bring on more equipment. Uh, we've actually, because of of the underbuying last year, we've we've we're in the process of surveying some of the larger box owners to find out if they're changing their plans for this year in light of the stronger market. Uh, but we don't have an answer for that at this time. Right, and almost all of that is produced in China by the container manufacturers there, uh, who also build ISO boxes as well. Um, and one other thing to note is that the European market and Asia to Europe is the biggest trade lane in the world, the European market is recovering quite strongly. So that might put a little more pressure on production of a domestic container as well. Here's a question about the PNW. You'd mentioned that the cargo going through there is down. Do you see a recovery potential or, or do you see that kind of continuing on that trend? Might continue on that trend for a little bit. Certainly Western Canada grew a bit, and but the Pacific Southwest grew a bit and Houston grew a bit. So it's hard to say where the uh, PNW cargo is is going, but probably the the losses haven't uh, stopped. I think maybe mid year you'll get to a, a comp with year over year of 17 where the losses flatten out. But for the first quarter, it's probably going to continue to lose a little bit of volume. Mm -hmm. And it's bounced up and down quite a bit over the years. Yeah, um, and also the the uh, oil production uh, west part of the United States also might push some uh, some freight to different locations because that tightens up the rail capacity. And then if I could throw in a, a little bit more detail to the, uh, the question on whether tight trucking capacity would affect all water share, maybe we give a hypothetical. Let's say a shipper wants to get a box uh, from Asia to Columbus, Ohio, and you could route that over the West Coast or you can route that over the East Coast. If it routes over the West Coast, probably isn't going to go truck to Columbia. It'll probably go go rail. If it goes to the East Coast, let's say it goes into New York or Norfolk, Savannah, pick your port, Columbus isn't all that far away, so maybe it could get trucked economically off the port, but it could also go intermodal for many of those locations. Right. And I think where you're going to see the, the pressure on truck prices, what that might do is if the shipper decides that all water was the way to go to get his, their box to Columbus, they might Split, shift the mode from trucking it to Columbus to railing it to Columbus from the eastern port. My gut feel would be you wouldn't send that box off the east coast and bring it to the west coast and rail it all the way. If, if you were satisfied with the all-water share and all-water service, mm -hmm. the tight trucking probably wouldn't push you to the west coast, but it may make it go IPI off the east coast instead of truck off right. the east coast. Right. And trucking prices have had the biggest impact of any sector, any segment, on IPI loads off of the East Coast. So quite, a, quite a bit up and down as, as fuel prices or other or trucking capacity change. A couple of questions kind of, I think, that, that plug right in there around the impact of the expansion of the Panama Canal on the all-water share volume. You've covered it a little bit, but a couple people want to dig into that a little bit deeper. Sure. So our sense of the Panama Canal is it's changed the type of vessels going to the East Coast. It's changed the size. It's changed some routings. Uh, certainly, it's changed the size by a big measure. But it has a changed share from the West Coast to the East Coast. Doesn't really seem to be the case. I mean, all water share has been steadily increasing since 2002. And you've seen some big shifts in share when there have been labor disputes. So the 2002 labor dispute shifted a lot of cargo to the East Coast. And at that time, a lot of the BCOs said they want to diversify and go to this four corner strategy where you have distribution centers in the Pacific Northwest, in the Pacific Southwest, in the Southeast, and in the Northeast. And that really started to, the shift occurred after the 2002 labor dispute. Uh, happened a little bit in 2008, but the labor dispute was fairly modest then. But in 2014, there was another big labor dispute on the West Coast, and that pushed another big spike to uh, right. to the East Coast. 
And uh, during the recession, um, there was significant capacity through the canal because there was just less freight, uh, but we didn't see a big share jump because of that. So that suggested to us an expansion of the canal uh, would not cause that to happen. Uh, the other thing too, of course, that, that people I think don't always recognize, Panama Canal has four major competitors, BNSF, Union Pacific, Canadian Pacific, and Canadian National. And they're not just going to say, oh, go ahead, take it all. Mm -hmm. uh, they're going to compete with it. And when you look at, at vessel size, say before the canal, say 2012, the average ship size to the West Coast might have been a 6,500 TU vessel versus through the Panama Canal to the East Coast was 4,500. And that gap is about 50%, 40%, right, between 6,500 and 4,500. Right. So now you have an expanded Panama Canal, you can bring some very large ship through there, and you're seeing 10,000 TU vessels going to the East Coast, but you're seeing 14,000 TU vessels going to the West Coast. So that same gap exists where you see a 40% bigger ship going to the West Coast than the East Coast, and arguably you're getting the economies of scale of a 40% bigger ship to the West Coast. Same like you were in 2007 where the ship right. sizes. So on a relative basis, maybe all that much hasn't changed, except the ships have gotten a lot bigger, right. but going to the coast. Yeah. And also the, the greatest population growth in the U.S. is in the southeast, and that's been a, a key driver of all water share. Uh, we're going to take more to Savannah or Charleston because there are just more people living there. Right, and they're moving away from places that used to have or that were served by the West Coast, say Chicago and other places in the upper Midwest. Great. Well, I, th I think we can sneak in maybe one more question. And I like this one because I think it, it kind of puts a nice kind of bow on this. What risks do you see to the overall economic growth for 2018? Well, I think the greatest risk for both for overall economic growth and for our industry is trade policy. That if we had uh, big changes to NAFTA or big changes to our dealing with uh, China or other things, that could have a major impact on uh, the economy. This year now, there's you know we think the short-term risk of recession is relatively small. We do see growth from tax reform, but we're at pretty uh, high-level employment um, at this at the moment. Um, inflation is starting to pick up, uh, so there's some risk to that as well. So we'll we'll see where all of that goes. But trade policy is probably one of the, the biggest things to be concerned about as a risk right now. That makes a load of sense. Well, gentlemen, I appreciate everything that, that uh, you presented to us today. It was uh, enlightening and, and very compelling. To all the attendees, thank you for uh, for joining us today. If you'd like more information about the Intermodal Market Trends and Statistics Report and the ETSO database that is the, is the core numbers database that Market Trends draws on, please visit intermodal.org or email us at info at intermodal.org.